Today we've got a really nice infinite product identity from Ramanujan's Lost Notebook. So let's look at it. So we've got the product as n goes from zero to infinity of one plus four over two n plus one to the fourth power, all raised to the minus one to the n times two n plus one. So that's our product. And that's going to be shown to be equal to e to the 8g over pi times 1 minus e to the minus pi over 2 over 1 plus e to the minus pi over 2 all squared, where g is the Catalan constant. So I've got a previous video on the channel about the Catalan constant if you'd like to check it out. Also, I've got a previous video on the channel where we derive this following hyperbolic secant identity, which we will use. And we'll show that, or we will use that the hyperbolic secant of x is 4 pi times the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of minus 1 to the n, 2n plus 1, and then 2n plus 1 squared pi squared plus 4x squared. Furthermore, we're going to use this identity that relates the inverse tangent and the logarithm. And here I've just put the version of that we will use where it's already been evaluated at something. Again, we've got another video on the channel where we prove some identity like this more in general. And finally, we're going to use something about the complex logarithm, which again, we've got a video of that on the channel. And that's the log z is the natural log of the modulus of z plus i times the argument of z. So there's a lot of moving parts here. Okay, so if you notice that a lot of these tools down here look like perhaps we've taken a logarithm of this whole thing right here, this whole identity that we're trying to work with. And that's, in fact, how we'll do this. We'll look at a sum version of this, which is essentially like taking a logarithm of a product. And in order to do that, let's set s of x equal to the following. So this is going to be the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity. We'll have minus 1 to the n times 2n plus 1. So notice that's our exponent here. So that becomes our multiplier. And then we'll have the log of, so it's going to be something related to this right here. And that'll be 1 plus lambda times x squared all over 2n plus 1 squared. Okay, nice. And well, where are x and lambda coming from? So let's observe that x will be taken from the interval from 0 to infinity. Lambda is a complex number. Let's also observe that if we evaluate s at 0, we get 0. Now we're going to take the derivative of this in order to maybe study its structure a little bit more closely. So here we've got to use the chain rule to take the derivative. And I'll uh, use a, some simplification here that we won't show um, you know, precisely. But here we'll have the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity. And then we'll have minus 1 to the n, and then 2 times lambda times x times 2n plus 1. So that's occurring in the numerator. And some of those parts are already in the numerator. And the other parts we gain from taking the derivative of all of this with respect to x. So in particular, the 2 times lambda times x. And then in the denominator, we'll get 2n plus 1 squared and then plus lambda times x squared. And we get that from maybe putting those two terms together, finding a common denominator. And now what we'd like to do is take this and multiply it by pi squared over pi squared to make it look like this hyperbolic secant um, series that we have over here. So we can now write this as pi times x, or I should say lambda times x times pi all over two, and then multiplied by 4 pi, and then multiplied by the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of, now we've got minus 1 to the n, 2n plus 1 squared, all over 2n plus 1 squared times pi squared. We get the pi squared from multiplying this through. And then plus 4 times the quantity pi the square root of lambda times x over 2 all squared. So that's like playing the role of just this plain x over here. Okay, so now using this formula uh, directly on that term over there will give us the following. We have 
lambda x pi all over two, and then we'll have this hyperbolic secant evaluated at pi times radical lambda times x all over two. But that's the derivative of s with respect to x. Now that together with the fact that s of zero equals zero means that we can write s of x as lambda times pi over two times the integral from zero up to x of t times the hyperbolic secant of pi times the square root of lambda times t over two dt. So again, that's just by taking like a formal antiderivative, if you will. But now we can apply the rule for writing hyperbolic secant in terms of exponential functions to rewrite this immediately like the following. We have pi times lambda, again, keeping in mind that the hyperbolic secant is one over the hyperbolic cosine. And then we've got our integral from zero to x of t times e to the minus pi square root of lambda times t all over two. And then in the denominator, we have one plus e to the minus pi times the square root of lambda times t over two. And again, that's what we gain from writing hyperbolic secant as one over hyperbolic cosine, and then maybe multiplying the numerator and the denominator by e to the minus all of this stuff right here. And then here we have dt. And now what we can do is do a quick change of variables. So let's say t is equal to minus two over pi times the square root of lambda times the natural log of y. But that means that dt equals, well, I'll let you check. It's not too easy. It's not too hard to figure out dt. It's just gonna be this constant times dy over y. I think that's pretty clear. And that's gonna transform this into four over pi. And then we'll have the integral from one up to e to the what? Minus pi times the square root of lambda times x over two. So that's changing the bounds of integration using our change of variables here. And then we'll have the natural log of y over y squared plus one dy. And now what we'll do is do a round of integration by parts on this integral. So I'll set up my integration by parts on this board and then we'll rewrite it at the top of the next board. So I'll take u to be the natural log of y. That means that du is uh, dy over y. And then dv will be my dy over y squared plus one, which means my v is the arctan of y. And then of course I'm gonna use my formula. The integral of u dv is uv minus uh, v times the integral du, or the integral of u, v du. Okay, so let's get to that. Okay, so this is where we ended up on the last board after doing that round of integration by parts that I hinted at. And now I'd like to point out immediately that this integral over here, or I guess I should say my original integral went from zero to one, or sorry, from one to this upper bound right here. But I've changed it to an integral from zero to that upper bound, and then I've subtracted off the integral from zero to one. Of course, subtracting off here means that I'm adding because this is attached to a minus sign. But then that integral that I included is in fact equal to g Catalan's constant. So I'll again let you look that up if you need to, but that's a pretty straightforward proof, just expanding that as an infinite series and then using the definition of Catalan's constant. Okay, and then what do we wanna do from here? Well, from here, we're going to evaluate this at certain values of x and lambda. So let's set x equal to one half, and let's set lambda equal to eight times i, but that means that the square root of lambda is equal to two times uh, one plus i. That's a pretty easy complex square root to take. But then where does that leave us? That, so that means that s, I won't write s of x here because we've evaluated. I won't write s of a half either, I'll just write s is now equal to four over pi times g, bringing that out front. 
and then minus two times one plus i times the arctan of minus i times e to the minus pi halves, and then minus four over pi, and then we've got the integral from zero up to i times some number. It's in fact the same thing as the argument of the inverse tangent here, but I wanna just point out that it's i times a real number. That's the important part here. And then I can expand this as the sum as n goes from zero to infinity of, that's gonna be minus one to the n, y to the two n over two n plus one, and then dy. And now what I wanna notice is that this thing over here is going to be pure imaginary. And now how can we see that? Well, this is i times a real number. Then when we integrate this, we get y to an odd power. But if you take a pure imaginary number, which i times a real number is, and you exponentiate it to an odd power, you'll get a pure imaginary number. I think that's pretty clear. But now what we'd like to do is take the real part, and that means that that will not contribute anything to the real part. But before we do that, let's take this inverse tangent term and rewrite it using this over here to see what we get. So this is going to turn into minus i times 1 plus i. And then we'll have the natural log of 1 minus e to the minus pi over 2 over 1 plus e to the minus pi over 2. Just like we have over here. And now we can extract the real part, and we'll see that the real part of s is equal to 4 pi over g, and then plus the natural log of 1 minus e to the minus pi halves over 1 plus e to the minus pi halves. Okay, so there we have that. We're going to hold on to that, and then we're going to analyze the real part of s using our original formulation of s. So we just determined that the real part of s was this thing right here. Now we want to use the original expression from s. I'll let you look that up if you have it. And evaluate that at x equals half and lambda equals 8 pi. So that's going to give us the following. So we'll have s is equal to now that sum as n goes from 0 to infinity. So recall that this was before we did any of the stuff with this hyperbolic secant, and then minus one to the n, two n plus one, and now we have the log of one plus two i over two n plus one squared. Great, but now we wanna use the fact that the log is this thing over here. So it's the natural log of the modulus plus i times the argument. I guess keeping in mind that if we take the real part of this, we'll simply get the natural log of the modulus. So what does that leave us with? So we've got the real part of s is going to be the following. So it's going to be a half. You might say, well, where does this half come? It comes from taking the modulus of this, which will involve a square root. And then we'll have the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of minus one to the n, two n plus one, uh, just like we have right here. And now we'll have the natural log of one plus four over two n plus one quantity to the fourth power. And again, that comes from finding the modulus of this stuff in here. Notice that we could write that, for instance, as two n plus one squared plus 2i over 2n plus 1 squared. But then we multiply that by, well, the complex conjugate of what we have here, and that'll give us the modulus squared. And then you can see that that's uh, pretty quickly going to come to this right here. Okay, nice. But now let's look at what we have. We've got the real part of s is simultaneously this over here and this right here observe that we could perhaps multiply this one half over and we would have the following. 
we'll have this sum as n goes from zero to infinity, minus one to the n, two n plus one, and then our log of one plus four over two n plus one to the fourth. Multiplying that two over will give us eight Catalan's constant over pi, and then plus the natural log of one minus e to the minus pi over two over one plus e to the minus pi over two all squared. Where I use the fact that I can bring the multiplier of two inside of the logarithm by logarithm rules. But now observe that if we exponentiate both sides, or I guess before exponentiating both sides, observe that we can take this and deposit it in the exponent. So I'll just write that as going into the exponent right here. And then we can exponentiate both sides and we immediately have our result. And that's a good place to stop.